All right. I have broken things down into five basic organ segments. I know there are a lot of them. I, I told you three years I've been working on this. Okay, but I also uh, put some icons in so that you can see some basic facts about every case. So 37 of the 50 cases we will look at have our motor vehicle collisions, and that will be designated with that uh, green triangle. The other causes, well, we have the typical uh, guns and knives. Actually, that's not a knife, it's a screwdriver. Uh, we have a soccer mishap, and then we've got a bull, a horse, a doctor, and a woman. So those are the potential uh, the sources of these traumas. I also went to the National Center for Biometric Information and pulled the expected mortalities for every one of these injuries. So you'll see that with each one. And then uh, whether or not the patient lived is certainly an item of interest. So a deceased patient will be designated with that ghoulish skull icon. And then whether the radiologist actually made the call or not, did they see the finding? That'll be a, a red X if the radiologist missed the finding like Miss Othmar used to put on your grade school tests. So what this ends up is we have iconized all these things for every one of these uh, entities, and you'll see those at the bottom of the screen. So if you ever think, hey, did this guy make it? You just look to the bottom and you'll be able to see the icon. Okay, let's go with aortic trauma. This is one that you may have seen before if you've seen me lecture, it's one of my favorites. And what can I tell you? Teaching files save lives. I almost always go into the teaching file on the first of the month. It's just my routine and I go through and look at everything that's been put in there. But one day, it was March 15th, I still remember. I just, I had a spare minute and I went into the teaching file and there it was right at the top. It said, ductus diverticulum. And I thought, well, I'm doing that aortic talk. I might as well see. It was from a, a really solid radiologist who put this in as a ductus diverticulum. So I opened it up and went, <laughs> Oh, that is very irregular for a ductus diverticulum. Now, do note, there is no stranding around that aorta. I've been over and over this thing. There is no stranding surrounding it. And so I really kind of struggled. I thought, well, it's so irregular. It's got to be a tear. But, you know, there's just no stranding at all. And I've always been taught you're going to see stranding. Well, look at this. Down in the abdomen, there are these well-circumscribed wedge-shaped subcapsular hypodensities. And this is going to be a theme we're going to see over and over. With large vessel injuries, you get these microembolic phenomena. And we're going to see it tomorrow in the med mal cases as well. Do not call these nonspecific peripheral hypodensities and blow them up. Right? They are very significant in a trauma patient, both in the kidneys and the spleen. We'll be seeing these. Interestingly, there's no fluid around the spleen either. This whole case was read as a ductus diverticulum with a possible splenic laceration. So, uh, Josh, do you remember this? I called you. I was freaking out and I called you. And Josh, Josh was my resident more than 20 years ago. I did, he did not learn his cynicism from me though. Uh, I called him and I said, what do you think? He said, yeah, I think that's a tear. And I think if they try to fix it, they might kill her. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I did. we did call it. I called it in and it had been about 36 hours. And they said, yeah, because we thought there was a splenic laceration. We kept her lying flat for 48 hours and we were just about to get her up and walk her around. Uh, so here it is on the sagittal. I don't think there can be any doubt. There is a flap there. The other thing that's important to note is you've got that tiny pseudo aneurysm. That's not a ductus diverticulum, right? It's pointed in the wrong direction. It's much more vertically oriented than a typical ductus diverticulum will be. And it's farther back on the curve of the aorta, right, than a uh, typical ductus is going to be. Right? So that is definitely a tear. So let's look at the video. There is that irregular aortic defect. And then we go down and there are those splenic hypodensities. Very helpful, those splenic hypodensities. I mean, that, for me, just absolutely sealed the deal. All right, and there it is on the sagittal, that flap, quite evident. And again, note the orientation of that pseudoaneurysm. It's vertical and not horizontal. I even threw in, this was from you, Ed, thank you. 
a nice case of a PDA, and you can see that that's almost horizontally oriented, and it's farther proximal on the aorta, right? It's inserting right at the base of the left PA. And so those are not the same finding. All right, interestingly, they kept her flat for another week, and uh, per Josh's advice, they did not operate on her or try to fix it, and this was the follow-up. So you can see it's a lot smoother, it's created a little pseudoaneurysm there, and the splenic findings have resolved, and there it is on the sagittal. And so she did just fine. And see, you can go across the bottom there. You can see it was an MVA, expected mortality of 59%. The patient lived, and the radiologist missed the finding. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, search satisfaction is a big deal in radiology, but it's a particularly big deal in aortic lacerations. All right, this is beyond search satisfaction for me. When I see this, it's a search distraction. Right. I when I think of search satisfaction, I picture myself at my smuggest, right? Preening and saying, Oh, I just made this really tough finding. That's not what happens to me when I see an aortic laceration. I get a whole body chill and goosebumps, and I slide to the front of my chair and my palm sweat and my heart pounds. Right. So that will distract you from all kinds of other findings. And we are going to see so many aortic lacerations associated with other injuries. So the important point is don't be distracted, right? So here we've got a pseudoaneurysm, a lot of mediastinal density in this one, a lot easier to call. There's a branch vessel avulsion here. It might be an inferior phrenic or lumbar, but I don't think anybody's going to miss that. Remember, of course, aortic root and diaphragmatic hiatus are the next two most common places that you'll see an aortic laceration. But look at this. That little bulge of contrast there on the left aspect of the IVC is an IVC pseudoaneurysm. Way to go on this, John Crawl. He put this one in for me. All right, so there is the aortic laceration with the pseudoaneurysm. Note again, all that mediastinal density and even a periaortic hematoma tracking down through the inferior mediastinum. And then we've got that little branch vessel avulsion, but watch the IVC here. Oof, easy to miss. Interestingly, I uh, I gave a trauma lecture three or four years ago in Florida, and the director of that program came up to me afterwards and said, you had three IVC lacerations, that's incredible. Well, now I have five in here. Um, and the thing that's amazing about it is they did not operate on a single one of them. Uh, they will typically watch these, even though they have a high mortality of around 54%. All right, so that was an IVC laceration. All right, this one is an aortic transection. Again, we've got the mediastinal density and the proximal aspect of this tear. And we have an intervening segment of dilated aorta. That's not really aorta, right? That's a pseudoaneurysm that's bound by adventitia. And then you can see the distal aspect of the tear. So this is a complete transection where the aorta has pulled apart, but the adventitia is still intact. When we go down to the abdomen, though, look at that. The nephrograms are markedly asymmetric, and that's something that should definitely catch your eye. In addition, there is retrograde venous contrast. So that's right renal vein that you are seeing filling retrograde. Now, I always like to point out, you want to see a contiguous column of contrast if you're going to call this retrograde, right? contrast uh, due to uh, rapid injection, All right? And you can see that it's actually in the suprarenal vein and then we can track it all the way down. We don't quite get low enough to see it coming through the right renal vein. So if you see renal venous opacification, but you don't see that contiguous uh, retrograde contrast going down the IVC, does anyone know what that would suggest is the diagnosis? We're gonna see one later. It's gonna be a renal AVF, All right? This one is a right renal artery avulsion. You've got the asymmetric nephrograms and that venous contrast is due to retrograde. All right, so a very interesting case and we'll see the uh, 
the companion case for that soon enough. The three Ds really bring home these transactions, I think. It just makes it really clear that that's torn through and pulled apart. And that intervening dilated segment is just bound by adventitia. The three Ds aren't always helpful, but in this case, I think that's pretty cool. All right, and we actually did a T-spine on this guy. So we've got a magged view. So there again is the transection. And then we've got a sagittal, shows you the same thing. All right, so that's an aortic transection with renal artery avulsion. That patient made it and they actually uh, saved his kidney as well. All right, this one is in here for calibration. I think uh, Greg Kennehertz gave me this one. Uh, I will oftentimes come out to my workstation and find uh, Teams messages or texts and the like, and he directed me to this one. So you can see the aortic tear here and just a complete filling of the left hemithorax with extravasated contrast. So we go down, you can see where it's coming from. This was that intervening segment that was dilated, the part on the patient's left. And then it has blown out medially to the patient's right and is bleeding into the mediastinum and from there into the left pleural space. So the reason I put this in is it helps everybody to calibrate. I think this is probably where that uh, leak from the mediastinum to the left pleural space is happening. This helps everybody calibrate because I pulled this up and I thought to myself, if this patient isn't dead, I don't understand anything about this. <laughs> and that was in fact the case. So I called uh, for the follow-up and this patient had died shortly after the scan, which I'm very appreciative of. I in fact hope to die on a scanner as well to help you guys out. It's a nice thing to do. All right, so next one, aortic laceration and main stem intubation. This is a really interesting case because I, as an ER doctor, I, I always said my best procedure, the one at which I was most proficient, was the right mainstem bronchus intubation. I could get an ET tube in your right mainstem bronchus hanging from the ceiling by my toes. I could just do it on everybody. And so I liked to tease the ER doctors. When I saw a mainstem intubation, I would always call up and say, oh, what are you doing over there? And then I'd laugh and say, actually, I'm the master at this. I could teach you how to do it better, right? So I was getting ready to tease this guy. And then as, as the phone was ringing, I went, wait a minute, that's in the left, right? It's in the left mainstem bronchus. So this guy also has, an aortic laceration. You can see it's right there on the anterior part of the root. He's got massive trauma to his right ribs, a lot of density in his right lung, which is probably hemorrhage in this setting, and even some density in the right bronchus. And then lastly, again, there is that left main stem bronchus intubation. And it hit me, he meant to do it. He meant to intubate the left main stem bronchus because that protects the right lung from barotrauma, right, of mechanical ventilation, and it protects that left bronchus, that whole left lung, from the hemorrhage that could cross the carina. In fact, they used to tell us when you were intubating someone in the ER, if you got a bunch of blood coming up through the ET tube, the thing to do is push it in farther because you may go past the carina, get it into the right main stem, and if that blood was coming from the left, you will protect the right lung by doing that, right? So it's a 50-50 shot if you don't know which side it is. But if you are really good and you see the whole right chest of your patient stove in, then you intubate the left main stem. Brilliant. I called it up. This guy was from Tennessee and he had kind of a drawl. And I said, you meant to do that, didn't you? And he said, yeah. And I said, how'd you, how'd you get it in there? And he says, I torqued it. <laughs> in fact, uh, when I looked at the rest of this case, you could tell this guy had a right chest tube in. It just, it's beautifully positioned. It's subpulmonic. It's right super diaphragmatic under the, under the lung, over the diaphragm. I went down to the groin. He had a perfectly placed right femoral line. And I remember I sat back and I thought, I sucked at this. I was not that good. <laughs> so anyway, that's a great view of that laceration there, again, on the anterior aspect of the root. 
and then we'll look one last time at the uh, intubation. There's the pulmonary hemorrhage, the rib fractures, and lastly, that left main stem bronchus intubation. Pretty impressive. And this patient made it, and in no small part due to this ER doctor's expertise. All right, next, an aortic laceration with a hepatic contusion. Actually, a few other uh, injuries here, and this is one at the diaphragmatic hiatus. This was a missed finding, and it should not have been. Uh, we've got, obviously, uh, extrathoracic gas in the soft tissues here. There's some rib fractures, and there is what is probably a contusion, an ill-defined hypodensity there in the lung. I think, actually, this patient's diaphragm is most likely lacerated as well. You can see that little bit of rib is uh, catching the diaphragm, and there's a small soft tissue gap there. So there's certainly a lot to distract you, but look at that periaortic stranding, and look at that sliver of contrast extending out into the wall of the aorta, right at the hiatus. So that's an aortic laceration of the descending aorta. This patient was admitted, had a chest tube placed, was admitted for the presumed liver injury, and died at 4 a.m. the next day of a, a ruptured aorta. So that one is a descending, and I just can't call your attention enough to that stranding, that retrocural stranding around the aorta that really should have called the radiologist's attention to that. 